Well, welcome back to the Azure podcast. This is episode number 472 being recorded on the 6th of September, 2023, with special guest Farzad Sunawala. I'm Sajid, and on Teams with me, we have Kendall, Evan, and of course, our special guest Farzad, who we're going to get to in just a minute. And of course, it's nice to see Kendall back uh, on the show as well. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> We still have, we have to have, we have to hear back from Cynthia one of these days. Hopefully she'll she'll get on on one of the she's, shows. As she's she's well. too busy, you know, doing the TED tour at this point, right? Yeah, she's I know, too. which is so cool. <laughs> she's way too cool for this now. <laughs> yeah, uh, but before we get started with uh, Farzad, uh, let's cover some updates. Uh, and uh, Evan, uh, I have a few. Should I get started, or do you want to cover? I, some? I've got so I've got two. Um, one relatively <laughs> minor, but I I still think it's important, and then another one that just sort of blows my mind a little bit. Um, but one of them for Azure Firewall, um, so there's now the ability to upgrade or downgrade your SKU without any downtime, right? And this is really nice because if you've got an event coming up or maybe you were, you, know, you had an event and you don't need all the features of premium post the event, right? You don't have to take downtime to, to switch back right. your SKUs. Now, that being said, standard SKU is better for, or I'm sorry, premium SKU is better for production workloads. But if you need to change, you need to change. The other one that sort of blew my mind, I don't know if y'all caught this, but we announced the um, public preview of the MV3 media memory virtual machines, right? And so I, I, I looked at this, I was like, oh, they'll you know, sort of be a couple hundred you know, gigabytes of memory. Uh, the, the media memory is 2.8 terabytes at the large size. Um, and see, because I remember the days when 64 gigabytes was considered massive in Azure, it just, like I just thought I'd call that one out because it, it really blows my mind that that's just the medium memory skew um, at this point. So it, it's amazing where things have come. Indeed, yeah, Good, great. <clears throat> well, I've got just a few, I'll run through them real quick. Uh, so uh, the app configuration, we've talked about that. It's a nice way you know, applications can externalize their configuration. They've added a new snapshot feature, which is really cool now, right? So you can take a snapshot of your current uh, state, so to speak, right, of all your configuration. And then maybe uh, the, you can see if there's any drift later on, right? Or if you have to go back to a particular version, hey, somebody made a change, we don't know what it is, let's go back to this last known well good, uh, last known good configuration, and you can go back there. So that's uh, that's really a nice feature. Uh, also, uh, Azure Container Apps, uh, I'm sure uh, Kendall will be familiar with this. Uh, you know, they've added the feature where they have, you can open up additional ports now. It used to be you could only have a single port. Now there's a preview feature where you can have additional TCP ports open on, um, uh, on Azure Container Apps. Also with Azure Container Apps, they've opened up the feature which uh, Kubernetes supported, which is jobs, right? Kubernetes always had the concept of jobs, but that was not surfaced in ACA. Now ACA has a concept of jobs and it's to externalize as uh, a nice serverless uh, 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 mechanism to, to run a single uh, task, right? If you just want to run a single uh, piece of code just for a, a few, uh, for some period of time, in a serverless way, but as yet managed by ACA with all the networking goodness and all that, you can do that now. So, so that's uh, another new feature. Uh, Azure Functions, uh, if you use .NET, uh, like I, I have done in the past, you know, .NET apps can sometimes take a little time to first start up for the first time, the cold start problem, and they have improved upon that now for .NET apps. And also for .NET, they've added support for .NET 8 in Linux environments in uh, in functions, so if you have uh, new apps that use those features in .NET 8, you, you, know, you can try them out now. Uh, and also um, uh, available for uh, AKS now is the ability to control when AKS gets updated. You know, AKS always is doing updates in the background, but they do it at a time which I mean, you may not really like. Uh, so now you can kind of manage that uh, maintenance window. Say, okay, you know, hey, uh, this is my business time. This is my not so busy business time. And you can provide some ideas to when they can update your node operating system. Uh, and finally, uh, there's some updates for uh, Azure SQL. Uh, you know, they've uh, allowed the, uh, you to externalize an API now from Azure SQL. And what that means is that if you have yes. other apps, uh, you know, other systems that only work in terms of API, like you don't want to do like a all fancy ODBC call and whatnot, right? You just need to call some API to trigger something and or get some, retrieve something from uh, Azure SQL. You can now do that very easily. A good example of that is uh, OpenAI, you know, where you, you just want to point OpenAI at your SQL database and say, hey, you know, go index this or go, you know, go query that. Uh, and, and now you can do that just with a single API without without much of a fuss. So, so yep, so that's, that's all the updates. <laughs> 
I see Kendall's. Yeah, and and I, I, yeah, I was just, I was, I actually really like that that API update. I, I read that, I saw it on LinkedIn the other day, and was reading about it. And I just, I like the idea of kind of moving toward this like developer centric sort of like perspective. I don't know. I just see a lot more developer centricity. I feel like not just from Azure, but just the the general ecosystem, especially you know within Kubernetes, but even on the data space, right? Like making it easier to consume, leverage these things from an application perspective. Uh, so yeah, I'm just a big fan of that that movement. Um, and then I was going to add one more on container apps to G. I, I thought maybe you'd, you'd get all of them, but uh, there is preview for MTLS uh, within a like container apps environment. So basically environment level, level network encryption, which this is something pretty much anybody coming from the Kubernetes space somewhat expects or needs, right? From a security perspective, I think this was a huge ask from customers. So like big kudos to the team for, you know, bringing MTLS in and really encrypting that communication across, you know, all of the applications running with within a container ops environment. So I think that's a, a big one for sure. So definitely check that out. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Thanks, Kendall. All right. Uh, well, uh, without further ado, let's get over to our special guest, uh, Farzad. Farzad, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, you know, I, I had the privilege of hearing uh, Farzad speak uh, at an internal uh, event uh, recently, and I was very impressed with the way that he uh, described and covered uh, a new feature in uh, in Azure uh, Cognitive Search. So I thought it uh, best to have him on and explain it to the rest of the world as to what this new feature is and how we can take advantage of that. But before that, first, I'll go ahead and introduce yourself uh, for our listeners. Uh, uh, tell us you know, what you do at Microsoft and what your passion is in the Azure space. Yeah, sure. Happy to be here. Uh, so yeah, my name is Farzad Senavala. I'm a uh, product manager on the uh, Azure Cognitive Search team, uh, responsible for our kind of newest, most in demand, personally I've ever uh, seen feature uh, called Vector Search, uh, with kind of going along the hype of transformer models, la large language models, uh, chat GPT, uh, vectors have become a probably probably the most red hot topic in kind of the the te digital technology field. I I swear it's the only like every week there's a new vector database coming up on the web or getting significant capital investment and it's such an ama amazing field. So definitely definitely talk about passion. It would have to be my day job is really just designing and developing the go to vector store uh, capability on Azure. Before we get that, uh, oh sorry. Uh... Kendall and you, you're on mute. Oh, she's out of uh, practice. That is no, what happens. <laughs> I know, I know. I haven't been using Teams either, so I'm like, I'm back in Teams. It's feeling weird. Uh, but first, I was just gonna say, do you work with uh, like Derek Luggins off at all, like on the cognitive search team? Uh, him and I graduated from college together. We were like in the same program. Anyway, I just think it's a, <laughs> such a solid team of. There's just such a solid team of people working on that product. Like he's done such an amazing job. So anyway, I just wanted to give, give a shout out there. Um, oh yeah, Derek, my Derek, Derek, Derek's too. my buddy, but I have to say I went to a rival school in LSU. Oh no! Oh no! Well, <laughs> college football season's coming up, so we'll see. We'll see. But yeah, anyway, this is I I I would say cognitive search is probably like my favorite Azure service, like selfishly. Uh, I just think it's amazing. And so I'm yeah, I'm just happy to have you here. I just wanted to kind of call that out. Uh, and, and I'm clearly behind here because somebody so vector search is what? Uh, so this is infrastructure guy, right? So you know what is what is vector search? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give some context. So, so I'm a I'm a dev by background, and so uh, definitely this this kind of area of search and AI now is like definitely come like converging together to ultimately provide like the best possible end user experience when it comes to information retrieval, multimodality search, chat with your data, whatever the use case may be. So typically, uh, it was funny because la last month. My nephew actually asked me, he's in fifth grade. He's like, Farzad, what do you do at Microsoft again? I say, oh, I'm working on vector, <laughs> I love that question. vector features for <laughs> Azure Cognitive Search. He's like, huh, like what's a vector? And I was like, okay, wow. Like, like it's not just a, f a fifth grader, but there's some really seasoned like software devs, like infrastructure folks that this is such like an emerging topic. I think and you just such compared a hot me to a right fifth now. grader in there. I think that's what I heard. <laughs> no, I just want to be very clear. He did, but I don't mind because he's kind of right. I mean, we don't know, we don't know about this, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I guess I'll first set the set the stage with just like some 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 key terms, and I'll kind of literally just just set, segment it out. So I always tell people like, okay, what's the definition of data? And so this is just, just my my as far as opinion, it's just a you know an organized collection of structured or semi-structured 
um, information. That's all data is. And so they say, okay, let's talk about a database. So what's a database? And so a database is essentially a, you know, a system built for easy access management and essentially querying the data at hand. And so then I'm like, okay, so what's a vector? And so some people may not know what a vector is from you know, your math or physics days, but essentially a vector is just a universal representation of data that contains in the world of kind of AI, a semantic information about some sort of underlying entity, whether it's text, sentences, words, images, audio, uh, regardless of the medium. And so then you put that together and you're like, okay, so what is a vector database? And why is this such a high, or vector search? We'll talk about vector search and vector databases because it kind of goes hand in hand. But a vector database essentially is a purpose-built database that efficiently kind of manages, stores, and uh, updates vectors at scale. And I really think scale is kind of the key word here. Um, and it's also important to, in the vector database, to retrieve the most similar vectors to give uh, and query considers um, the, the semantics of that query. And so that's where kind of vector search comes in, which is such such a hot and important topic, especially when you talk about the underlying infrastructure and mechanisms of large language models. Yeah, uh, and uh, that's that's really good, Farza. But I want to also uh, ground us on, you know, what is uh, the Azure Cognitive Search feature uh, or service at at high level, right? Just so that people know where this is coming from. Like it's been a while since we've talked about Azure Cognitive Search. To be honest with you, uh, so just a quick uh, primer on that uh, would certainly help people understand. Okay, you know, this this new feature now we're adding on uh, uh, for vectors. Uh, maybe that'll help. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, yeah, so for those of you who may not know, Azure Cognitive Search uh, is a service in uh, the uh, Azure AI platform. Um, some some customers actually call us a search as a service, um, but we're essentially a platform as a service uh, designed for developers and data scientists and engineers to essentially uh, build ser uh, search experiences. Um, so uh, kind of the common use cases of, of Azure Cognitive Search uh, is kind of the, I, I kind of segment them into four with kind of an emerging fifth is just the general kind of workplace search. You're an enter your large enterprise customer or, um, and you want to surface uh, some sort of uh, data, whether it's PDFs, SharePoint documents, uh, you know, whatever sort of data it may be, uh, and you just want to find the right document. So there's that workplace search vertical. And then there's a, a good amount of uh, um, ISVs and partners who actually use cognitive search to quickly build um, kind of market ready SaaS applications. So uh, if you want to build like a quick landing page for a new restaurant that you want to start, cognitive search, and if you want basic search functionality or even enhanced uh, search functionality with some of the AI features we have, um, you could build that really, really quickly with cognitive search and it's fully managed. Um, then we also see a good amount of e-commerce customers use cognitive search. So with the goal of buying a you know product or service, um, but you also want really high reliability. You want to scale really well when it comes to you know Black Friday or shopping season. Uh, cognitive search uh, has the capabilities to support that. And then kind of the fourth scenario is just just the general just website search. Anywhere there's a search bar and you just want you know filtering and faceting capabilities, maybe some security capabilities. Cognitive search has you covered as an Azure um, kind of enterprise uh, grade cloud cloud service. Um, and then kind of talk about vectors. So um, before I go to that, I see Evan's hand up. So I'll address your question and then we'll talk about yeah, vectors. I, I, I just want to I want to make sure I understand the use case. So, it, you know, historically, you know, and, and like the Azure podcast site, right? We've got a search on it. Um, I don't even, I'll be honest, I don't even know the engine that we're using under the covers, but it sounds like sort of in a modern day and age, I would drop cognitive search, cognitive search on top of that. And let it index and, and it's going to find sort of better relationships through the articles than just a typical keyword search and whatnot that we would probably have in there by default. Um, I, it, you know, and so that so it, it almost sounds like what you're describing is anytime I'm doing search, I probably want to start, you know, with the new cognitive, you know, capabilities rather than sort of the old vanilla. I'm just, you know, sort of indexing my data that's out there. Is there is there a scenario where I wouldn't go that route or should I always be looking at? you know, cognitive type capabilities. Nope, anywhere you see a search bar uh, okay. on the screen, use cognitive search. That's my okay. rule of thumb. Okay. And he is not paid by any means to tell you that. This is completely <laughs> unbiased opinion. He doesn't work for that team at all. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I, no, I, I'll actually give you, a totally fun, I'll, give you, I'll give you a fun fact, Kendall. Before I even joined yeah. Microsoft, I was a cognitive search customer at a, a energy company. Oh, okay. okay. So I, okay. I was one of the early adopters of cognitive search when it came out. I was a, as a customer. Cool. 
and I fell in love with this product. I'm like, oh my gosh, like as a software dev, this is saving me so much time. Like it's amazing, all the new features. And now here I am, now I'm designing for it. Wow, (laughs) that's super cool. I am curious, this is gonna be, once again, we're going, I'm kind of going back to like a a little bit of like a lower level question, but like, what is, what is the like representation of a vector? Like when I think of a document database, like it's a JSON object or whatever, like what is the actual, like uh, what would, I don't know, the object model, I guess, like how is it actually stored? Is it JSON? Is it like, or is it like vector dot something that I've never heard of before? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll I'll jump into I'll jump into that. So in most cases, um, I see a lot of customers using Azure Open AI embeddings. Probably, it's honestly my favorite. It works so well. Demos is it's absolutely amazing. And so vectors can typically they're they're represented as like an array of floats. Um, that's probably the most common kind of uh, object I've seen it. I've also seen vectors that are um, booleans. I've seen them that are ints. So it kind of depends ultimately upon the embedding model. Um, but ultimately, I think the rule of thumb is an array of floats is probably the most common that we see today. Explain an embedding model. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll give brief history for uh, my very tiny data science days um, when I first started my career, um, which essentially an embedding model is kind of a, a term kind of used by by data scientists a lot. And so a lot of times, uh, uh, embedding models are used for for NLP kind of application, natural language processing applications. So if you want to build like a semantic search experience, if you want to cluster uh, your data or classify anomaly detection, no matter the, no matter the scenario, you use embeddings to essentially have that vector representation. So a vector is more of like the mathematical term, but the more AI native data science term is, at, is is an actual embeddings. And so five years ago, embedding those models were incredibly difficult relative to today to uh, to train your own embedding model you have to you know customize your pytorch or and get the onyx file and and it was it was a lot of work to train and, and, and tune an embedding model now with the like as past six months of like large language models kind of revolution evolution whatever you want to call it like anyone can just take text like input it into a a, a rest api call and get your vector representation and to me like that is so game changing for those who like yeah. experience embedding models in the past. Okay. So then once you have that, once you've called the, you know, once you've called the API with your text, you've gotten back this vector model, what you're doing is essentially making it easier to then query on top of that and make meaningful use of it in some type of like end user application or uh, business context. Yeah, exactly. And so I'll kind of yeah. highlight the the key kind of design pattern of why I think we decided as a product group to invest in vector capabilities. Because as I mentioned earlier, cognitive search was just historically a full text search engine. That was what we designed from the ground up. And now, you know, we want to enter the vector space. We, we want to we want to be uh, competitive with native purpose built vector databases. And so the, the importance for that or business justification for that really comes from the statement that, you know, I think all of us probably said or heard someone say is, I want a chat GPT like experience on my own data. And so like, how many of you have heard that? Like, come on, everyone. (laughs) Everyone saying, yeah, everybody, yeah. Yeah, and so essentially that design pattern um, is is, uh, is it's, it's actually I think Meta was the one that uh, came out with the official paper about it. But this design pattern uh, that cognitive search is really important for enabling this use case of I want Chat GPT on my own data is called retrieval augmented generation, uh, or otherwise known as RAG, the RAG pattern. And so the reason why cognitive search and vectors are really important in this RAG pattern, and essentially I'll define what that is, is essentially where you have some sort of app or UI. And essentially, we know what prompts are, we know what tokens are, um, and so, uh, and we know what you know rate limits are. And so, in every single large language model, just the way the transformers uh, models works from an infrastructure perspective, there's always going to be a token limit. And so, there's only so much words or tokens or letters, characters, whatever you want to call it, you could pass into that large language model prompt. Yeah, we're seeing some open source ones like expand it, but for the most part, there's always going to be that upper limit. And so if I'm a large customer organization and I have terabytes of data that's in the trillions of characters or tokens, whatever it wants to be, I can't just inject all my data into a single prompt and say, oh, I want you to, to, to describe for me the revenue forecast for, for you know, this. You, you can't do that. And so 
what the retriever portion in this retrieval augmented uh, generation pattern is, is really where cognitive search comes in, where you use a search engine or a vector database to have a vector search experience where you vectorize all your, con all, all your content using an embedding model, um, often ones like Azure OpenAI, there's ones from uh, on Hugging Face that are really popular that I play around with. Um, and uh, every week I think there's new ones. There's actually a leaderboard that shows to see how who's more competitive. It's pretty cool on Hugging Face. And um, once you vectorize all this content, then you could actually insert those vector representations into cognitive search. And so now the new uh, vector search capabilities in cognitive search allow you to perform um, this uh, nearest neighbor search or approximate nearest neighbor algorithm to essentially find the most similar vectors to a certain query that someone might be typing in on their uh, chat GPT prompt or large language model prompt, and it will retrieve documents through through a through a search as a service like cognitive search using this algorithm, and um, once you have the the documents retrieved, uh, the the top you know one three five ten fifty however many chunks or tokens that will fit into your context window, um, you could pass that in into your large language model prompt. So you there's this term called grounding your large language model. This is grounding it by 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 giving it the context it needs. And so that's that's the biggest business value you get with vector search capabilities um, in Azure Cognitive Search. Uh, yes, as far as that, so when you when you query this vector database now, right? Because this is the database of floats, let's say, and arrays of floats, right? Essentially, there's a lot of numbers out there. And now when you send in your query, do you also have your, does your query also have to be uh, embedded or have the embeddings? Like, is, is, or do you pass in your query as text and you convert it? I'm guessing you have to do the embeddings before you pass it into the query? Precisely. So once you have a, uh, let's just, we talked about JSON earlier. Um, there's a there's a really hello world lightweight code sample I put together that has like all the Azure services, very lightweight schema of title, content, ID, category, and talks about Azure DevOps, Azure Cognitive Search, Azure Functions, all, and, and I wanted to, hmm, I want to do a semantic search experience. If I'm brand new to Azure and we have all these amazing services, how can someone type in natural language? Like, hey, I want a scalable storage solution, or I want a robust rich text uh, search service that supports vectors, something like that. They, they, they don't know the names or the, the descriptions of the services we have to offer, but I want this kind of semantic like search experience. So what's required in cognitive search is, as I mentioned earlier, you vectorize all those documents. And then it's also responsible, um, uh, well, once you have all the document vectors inside of your vector database, then you're also gonna, let's just say, I wanna query scalable store storage solution. Then I, using the same embedding model that I use to vectorize my document corpus, I have passed that query embedding scalable storage solution into that um, embedding model. And then that will allow me to take my query embedding, my document embedding, perform that approximate nearest neighbor uh, vector algorithm. And then I could use similarity functions. Most commonly what I see is cosine similarity. We've heard that term a lot um, to find the cosine distances uh, between the nearest uh, neighbors in a very high dimensional vector space, which allows you to give the most semantic search uh, like experience on, 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 uh, on your own data. So I'm assuming you get this question a lot. And as like someone who's heard everything you've said, and this totally makes sense and it's awesome. Uh, how does this, like the, the thing that I think of that kind of reminds me of this without maybe some of the complexity or like maybe the, the data size is gr like a graph database, right? Which I know we have like Cosmos DB that has like a graph database. I am curious, because to me this, I, I can kind of more draw a delineation between how is it different than like a document database, but maybe less so on a graph database. Do you have like kind of just, a quick like oh the bigger the biggest differentiation between like a graph and vector database would be x is it just the i don't know i don't know if that's a common question or if they're completely unrelated which maybe that's the answer is like oh they're not even in the same category yeah, I think that's a really good question, and I'll personally give my opinion as someone who's played around with, uh, you know, graph data start graph DBs um, all the time in, in kind of my past life. Um, I would say that uh, vector representations, ultimately, I asked the clarifying question is what is the problem uh, from a search perspective you're trying to solve at the end of the day? Um, do you really need a semantic similarity search? Uh, do you need to actually find and, and visually see the, the different relationships between a, a certain entity? Um, so. For, for most scenarios, especially that we're seeing nowadays with this retrieval augmented generation pattern, um, vectors are, are kind of the, the new search plus AI better together story of uh, okay. doing um, uh, 
you know, semantic similarity searches. Um, and it's actually funny because there's actually embedding models out there where you can take like a graph, like a, like a graph structure and vectorize it and then do an mm, approximate okay. nearest neighbor search, just like how you would with text embeddings, image embeddings, whatever. So that's kind of, I think the more AI native way of doing it. Mm. Okay, cool. Totally makes sense. You know, uh, I've been playing around with uh, with the vector vector search feature for the Azure podcast itself. You know, we've uh, uh, tra transcribed all of our uh, podcast episodes uh, using the Whisper model, and then uh, we you know we pointed uh, the Azure search uh, to it to, to index it and can ask queries out of it. And one thing I noticed is that there is a feature called semantic search in Azure Cognitive Search now, right? And that kind of uh, confuse me a little bit because it almost conflicts with uh, the vector search, right? I was hoping you can uh, demystify the, those two concepts for me. Yeah, honestly, I should just take your questions and put it in an FAQ in our <laughs> documentation. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you the, the the difference. So semantic search is a feature we've had in cognitive search for the past couple of years now uh, in preview. Um, um, Fun fact, scheduled to GA very soon. Uh, that hasn't been said yet, so this is the first, you guys are the first to hear it. Um, <laughs> and so, so what semantic search is, is it, it was essentially a, a vision within Microsoft of how can we leverage all the deep learning kind of research that's that's been done by the Microsoft Bing organization. And so essentially we, literally kind of copy and pasted a lightweight version of all the Bing, the, the models that power Microsoft Bing today and bring it in Azure for enterprise customers to take advantage of. And so the best home for that was kind of a cognitive search. And so it's a premium add-on feature um, in cognitive search that all you have to do is enroll in a, either if there's a free plan for it or a standard plan for it. Um, and it allows you to have what, what the, the term we hear a lot is SERP or essentially if you want like a mini Bing or mini Google on your own data where you get, you know, answers, captions, AI captions, highlights, um, you know, like if someone types in what is the capital of France, you see, you know, first result Paris and big bold text. So if you kind of want that like ex that experience on your data, semantic search works really, really well. Um, and then vector search is kind of, um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's completely free. It's included in the cost of your cognitive search service. Um, and so this allows you to perform a plethora of kind of uh, other scenarios. Uh, that's not just limited to text or kind of these, these uh, you know, building a mini Google or Bing on your own data. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, you can do things like uh, I have some customers using us for like recommendation systems. Um, I've, I have uh, one really cool use case of like a multimodal search where uh, for a, a e-commerce application um, where someone's vectorizing the, the images of grocery products uh, and the captions or description is grocery products. And it's really power like completely game changing for full text search. And so vector search kind of powers those sorts of capabilities and it allows customers who are taking advantage of kind of the large language models like Azure OpenAI service um, that they have out of the box and it allows so, like a like a home to, to do something with with one of these capabilities I will point out as kind of the last point is it vector search and semantic search is I think is a huge strategic competitive advantage that we have in Azure cognitive search over some other search services and vector databases we've actually run a lot of experiments and we've actually found this hybrid search I'm sorry Sujay, you may have played around with hybrid search this essentially allows us remember how I mentioned earlier cognitive search is historically a full text search service so it's all about uh, uh, for those search geeks out there the BM25 algorithm or essentially the TFIDF um, you know, uh, counting the the frequencies of keywords and then displaying displaying the scores and order uh, ranking inside uh, the, uh, uh, of your results set that way. And then we also have now vector search. And so uh, JFK files, love that. Um, and so we also have vector search that allows you to perform this more, you know, approximate nearest neighbor semantic similarity search. And so what we found that vector search alone does a really um, good job at kind of recalling the the most similar documents or nearest neighbors. But sometimes your ranking isn't actually going to be the best. And so what a lot of our experiments have shown is that having what we we call internally in level two re-ranker that takes the you know the top 20, top 50, top 7,500, however many documents, and throws it into another model, preferably a deep learning model, that will re-rank the documents. Um, will actually increase the precision or ranking and retrieval quality. And so that better together story of vector search and semantic search, because you get uh, re-ranking capabilities out of the box powered by Bing, 
that I think is so game changing because no other search service or vector database can say, hey, we get the power of full text search. We get the power of something like uh, open AI embeddings uh, 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 to vectorize my context of my data. And then we get literally the power behind Microsoft Bing uh, fueling my search experience. And so that's huge. What's um, <clears throat> when I'm leveraging these, should I be, you know, you talked about like grocery shopping and you talked about um, I forget what the other scenario was, but like these are typically, it sounds like the ones you're talking about are typically data sources that are slow changing, right? So I can, I can spend time and energy building the, building the semantic model. I can spend time and energy running all the models and then returning my results when someone asks for it. Will the models end up, or will, will these capabilities end up working for, and I'm, I'm sort of drawing a blank on a fast changing data source off the top of my head right now, but you know, can I also use it for fast changing stuff where I'm I'm almost really searching real time or is the processing power such that I, for now, I should be looking at things that are at best maybe moderately changing data sources. Like yeah, news would maybe a, be a good example yeah. of something that changes fast, right? Like on an hourly basis, that's gonna change. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, and so I'll, I'll give my honest opinion. So cognitive search, is historically uh, stock price is perfect example. Yeah. Um, cognitive, and so I kind of shape like things like stock prices or like uh, Azure Data Explorer, this kind of log analytics scenarios. Mm -hmm. Um, cognitive search isn't really well well suited for that. Um, so if you have like more of these like hey must have real time millisecond yeah. uh, type of uh, data data updates and writes, um, cognitive search probably isn't the best use case for that. I would recommend using something like uh, for for like Azure Data Explorer or Kusto yeah. that actually okay. funny funny enough has vector search capabilities as well, uh, a very lightweight version uh, built mm -hmm. into their product. So that's my honest opinion. Okay. Yeah, and I don't. I mean, I don't necessarily know that it's bad. It's just sort of balancing what you know. What's your use case against you know what's the right data source or what's the right model um, or engine for that particular data source? Great. Thanks. So, uh, for, it, oh, go, can you go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, in addition to everything I've learned so far, which has been a lot, so kudos. This has been <laughs> really, really good. I also learned that there's an, a very vibrant AI community called Hugging Face, which when you first said that, I was like, wait, what? Hugging Face? <laughs> no, I looked it up. It's Hugging Face, uh, and I love it. It's great. Now you got to tell a little bit. You got to explain a little bit more about what this community is. <laughs> Yeah, I, I could give a one liner. It's essentially um, uh, they have a lot of like open source kind of uh, embedding models. I usually use it just for embedding models, but th they have a, a lot of really cool things that you can use. Um, and so I highly recommend that. It's kind of like they, they also have challenges and things like that, similar yeah, to Kaggle. Okay. Um, so, yeah, really cool community. And if you just want to geek out and learn more about, you know, all things AI um, and machine learning, I think Hugging Face is a great resource. Nice. So just kind of to to wrap up over here, Farza, uh, what uh, what's the easiest way for someone to kind of get into a vector search? I think you gave an example of some hello world style applications that you may have put out there. Uh, like what's the like if someone like I guess a, a novice developer like myself who wants to try it out, how would they do it? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, we actually have uh, on our uh, cognitive search documentation on uh, docs. or I think it's learn.microsoft.com um, in cognitive search. Uh, we actually have a vector search quick start. Um, so it goes through, you know, how to provision a cognitive search service. You can get started best part completely for free. We have a free SKU. Um, vector search is free as well. You don't have to use something like OpenAI. You can um, use something like on Hugging Face and, and use a open source, a free embedding model, or really you could just play around and just type numbers in if you really want to, just to see uh, at a high level how it works. Um, there's two ways to kind of get data into cognitive search. You could just push it via REST API and then bam, you're done. Um, and so you can use tools like Postman or, or SDKs. We have SDKs in Java, JavaScript, .NET, and uh, Python. Python kind of, everyone's a Python developer nowadays. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, that's that, that would be my recommended way to get started. There's a bunch of code, code samples we have in our documentation. Um, and, and yeah, I uh, highly encourage everyone to get started. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Farzad. This has been really, really enlightening.
and uh, I'm sure our listeners will appreciate uh, the new features in Azure Cognitive Search. So thanks for explaining to, explaining it to us in uh, terms that we can all understand, fifth graders, uh, fifth grader style. So appreciate. I'm gonna that. remember that, Barzad. I'm gonna remember that. <laughs> uh, thanks again, and uh, we'll hope to have you on soon again. Thanks, thanks Barzad. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.